pressure the venue owner to try and cancel the event. So that research and coalition building with groups that are affected by various forms of fascist or white supremacist violence is a lot of what's done. What gets more of the headlines is when the demonstrations come out onto the street. And so as I'm sure you and, and a number of listeners are well aware, there have been high profile instances recently, such as in Berkeley, of trying to physically shut down events that has raised the profile of anti-fascism. Physically confronting people, that's part of the strategy, right? Yes, it is. It's an illiberal politics of social revolutionism applied to fighting the far right. In a recent article, you advocated for everyday anti-fascism. That is, anti-fascism that goes beyond, quote, punching Nazis. Right, so these glamorous topics, you know, the, the video of Richard Spencer getting punched got millions and millions of shares, but if we want to think about how to create an anti-racist society, an anti-sexist society, we need to think about the everyday interactions that... If someone is articulating a homophobic perspective or prejudicial against immigrants, am I doing what I can to try and change their mind? Am I raising some sort of opposition or am I tacitly going along with it because I'm just letting it slide? And so everyday anti-fascism is not having any tolerance for intolerance. It's not agreeing to disagree about hateful behavior and it's saying, look, if you're going to be part of my life, you need to shape up. You can't treat people like this. You can't say things like this. And holding people accountable. And ultimately, sometimes that means you need to end some friendships. Or it means maybe you should boycott the business down the street that's been rude to Latino immigrants. You say that our goal should be that in 20 years, those who voted for Trump are too uncomfortable to share that in public.